Hello, and welcome to this webinar from the DTG on audio and accessibility. I'm David Bradshaw, Chair of the DTG's Accessibility Group, and I'll be introducing our presenters. This webinar is part of an ongoing effort on the part of the DTG to compensate for the unfortunate but necessary cancellation of the one-day event, TV for All, Content for All. This is our first attempt at a webinar, and we've put it together in a few days instead of the weeks normally allocated to this type of event. So do please bear with us on this occasion. To enable subtitles to be added, our presenters have recorded their presentations from their offices and homes. However, they will be available online at the end of the webinar for a live questions and answers session. Unfortunately, only the presentations will carry the subtitles, which are based on speech recognition technology and involve a significant processing delay, which renders them unsuitable for a live Q&A session. However, the webinar is being recorded and a streamed version will be available with subtitles throughout. We will take questions at the end of the webinar. There is a Q&A box where you can type your questions, which the presenters will try and answer. Please include your name and affiliation in the question so that we can direct the answer to the correct person. One last point before we start. After the event, please fill in the survey to give us some feedback. And now to our first presentation, which will be given by Rupert Brunn from Fraunhofer. Rupert. Hello. Thank you, David. I'm Rupert Brunn, and I'm a consultant in the media industry specializing in next generation audio. I'm going to talk to you about the capabilities of next generation audio using MPEG H as an example, although there are other systems for next generation audio. So, what is next generation audio? It's a way of sending audio that allows the consumer to personalize it, they can adapt the sound to how they want it to hear. For example, turning the dialogue up and down is, is a clear example of changes that you might wish, wish to make. Next generation audio also supports immersion. You can have sound coming from all around the room, and with the latest generation of sound bars, you can do that without having loudspeakers all around the room. One sound bar underneath your television can put sound everywhere. Next Generation Audio also supports universal delivery. The content creator can make and distribute one version of the content, and the rendering to replay is done in the consumer device. So if you are listening on a mobile phone, the content can be rendered to binaural sound to give you immersive audio with earbuds. But if you have a home cinema system, the audio will be rendered to however many speakers you have. The content creator doesn't have to worry about that, and the consumer doesn't necessarily have to worry about it either. The device knows what replay capability it has and what's connected to it, and will render the audio to give you the best possible experience with whatever equipment you're using. We started work on this technology almost a decade ago with an experiment from the Wimbledon Lord Tennis Championships in which the BBC and Fraunhofer collaborated to allow viewers to adjust the mix of the commentary and the sounds from the court. What we discovered was that a large number of the users of this experiment pushed the slider slightly one way to make the commentary louder and almost the same number pushed it the other way to make the commentary quieter. There are clear reasons why people might do this. Uh, not only if you have uh, problems hearing, you might want the commentary to be louder if, for example, you're doing the cooking whilst watching the match. Equally, if you know your tennis really well, you might not want a commentary, you just want the immersive experience of being on centre court. We learned from this that one sound balance doesn't work for everybody and the BBC sound balancers were doing a superb job of creating a sound balance that was right in the middle of the range of sound balances people wanted, but which not necessarily very many people actually wanted. Since then, 
this early experiment has led to a generation of MPEG-H audio, which has been embodied in a very large number of standards and can be made available by broadcast or on online services. So, how does this magic work? With MPEG-H audio, we can send the sounds in three distinct ways. We can send channel-based audio in the way we always have, two channels for stereo, six for conventional 5.1 surround sound. And we can also send scene-based audio. This is high-order ambisonics, for those who are familiar with it. It's not hugely useful, perhaps, in broadcast, but it is widely used in gaming and uh, virtual reality, augmented reality applications, because you can rotate the whole sound field without too much processing power when the viewer turns their head. We also have object-based audio, and this is what delivers the personalization. Audio objects are sounds which are sent separately, not mixed in with everything else, along with some metadata. The metadata tells the consumer device what to do with these objects, where to position them in the room, how loud they should be, and what level of personalization is permitted. Here are some of the things we can do to improve accessibility using MPEG-H Next Generation Audio. The most obvious use case is dialogue enhancement. The metadata in the stream allows users to interact with the audio and decide how loud the dialogue should be compared with other sounds. Of course, as Lauren will explain later, it's not only dialogue that is important to understanding what's happening in a program and we have to consider other sounds too. The important thing is that the broadcaster controls the metadata and therefore controls the amount of interaction that is available. You don't have to let users have unlimited control over your content. We can also personalize audio description to allow people to control how loud it is. And multi-languages can be offered very, very efficiently without having to send multiple versions of all the audio. Here's an example from the European Athletics Championships last year. We created a number of presets which the viewer could select. The default one, which would be the normal as broadcast sound. A dialogue plus with the dialogue boosted and other sounds attenuated, English audio description, and venue sound, which had no speech at all and just allowed you to enjoy the sense of being in the stadium. Note that the broadcaster controls the number of presets and the labels they are given, and that they can be changed at any time during the broadcast. The broadcaster can also enable more advanced features as shown in this slide. Perhaps not many people would want this level of control, but it is possible to allow the user to have sliders so that they can adjust the sound exactly to their own preference. Here you can see that the language English has been selected and that the prominence of the dialogue can be turned up and down. And we can also move it in position. Clearly, if you only have a stereo set up on your television, you can only move the sound from left to right. But if you have immersive surround sound, you can also move it up and down. It can help with understanding the dialogue if it is moved to a slightly different position from the rest of the sounds on the screen. This example shows how audio description can be moved around the room. The advantage of this is that the audio description might be moved to sound as if it is coming from a place in the room near the person who needs it. Again, the cognitive load of understanding the audio description and separating it from everything else can be reduced if the sound is coming from a different direction. It can also be less distracting 
for other people watching the content at the same time who don't need the audio description if it's coming from a different part of the room from all the other sounds. And of course, the audio description uh, attenuates the other sounds when the audio describer is speaking. This is done with metadata and allows the user the opportunity to adjust for themselves how much the other sounds are ducked and how loud the audio description is so that they can have the audio description presented in a way that best suits their own needs. Of course, what we don't want to do is mess up the loudness of the signal. A lot of work has been done in recent years to ensure that different programs and adverts and announcements between programs have the same loudness level. We no longer have to turn the volume up and down every time there's a commercial break to the extent that we used to. MPEG-H audio uses loudness normalization uh, algorithms to ensure that whatever you do with the sound, turning dialogue up and down, introducing additional elements, the overall loudness will remain the same. You won't have to keep turning the volume up and down every time you personalize the audio. There have been a number of trials of MPEG-H Next Generation Audio, ranging from music at the Eurovision Song Contest, which was produced as live, to coverage of the French Tennis Open and the European Athletics Championships. So this is a real system which can be used for the most complex live programming if necessary. In summary, uh, MPEG-H Next Generation Audio was conceived from the very beginning, almost a decade ago, to provide improved accessibility through personalization. It's been widely adopted by broadcast and streaming standards worldwide, and it is still the only Next Generation Audio system which is deployed 24-7 for an ultra-high definition service, where it is on the air in South Korea. MPEG-H allows the TV screen and remote control be used for personalizing the audio without the TV having to decode and recode the audio. We've also recently heard that Sony 360 Reality Audio Music is based on MPEG-H and this will lead to an increase in the number of consumer devices which support the format. Thank you much for listening. Uh, there are some links here which you can use to find further uh, information if you wish. And I'll now pass you back to David to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Do please remember to submit your questions and comments in the question and answer box, and we'll try and answer them at the end of the session. Our next presentation is from Lauren Ward from BBC R&D at Salford. Lauren. Thank you, David. My name's Lauren Ward, and I'm working with BBC R&D on accessible audio, particularly for those with some degree of hearing impairment. So what I'll be uh, giving you a rundown of today is the Casualty Accessible and Enhanced Audio Trial that we did last year. Now, this was a collaboration between BBC Research and Development, BBC Studios Casualty Program, as well as the University of Salford. And what this project looked at was trialling a new approach to doing accessible audio for people with some degree of hearing impairment. I'll start off by giving you some of the background to this particular project and where the ideas for this approach came from. My PhD, which I've been working on for the past four years, has focused on looking at how people with hearing impairment access dramatic content, what are some of the challenges that they have accessing dramatic content, and how we can use things like next generation audio to get around those challenges. In particular, for dramatic content, a key challenge is, as Rupert mentioned, the balance between the foreground sound and the background sound. And this is something that when people have a degree of hearing impairment, 
the optimal balance for what the vast majority of people between that foreground and background sound may be different for someone with differing degrees of hearing loss. Next generation audio codecs, which again, as Rupert mentioned, give us a way of transmitting audio objects as separate objects rather than being uh, all bundled together as is the case with current linear broadcast. This offers us some solutions to this challenge that not the same audio balance works for every listener. By having these different audio objects with associated metadata, we can allow people to personalize the mix to their desired, preferred, or the balance they need in order to be able to understand the content. The challenge that this presents in dramatic content, however, is that it's not as simple as the merely speech versus background sound. There are a number of different audio objects that are included in the mix of dramatic content that have many different roles. They can be to build immersion. So in this case, we've got a screenshot from Casualty where you've got a monitor, a heart monitor in the background. This monitor will be beeping, but nothing is really tied into the story at the moment. That beeping is just to give you the sense of being there in a busy hospital. The exact same sound of that heart monitor beeping can actually be very important to the narrative at a different point in the program where a patient is flatlining. And that's an important key element of the narrative, that if we lose that, the narrative that we're watching won't be the same. So. This presents us with a bit of a challenge when it comes to personalizing uh, dramatic audio. So the challenge is, how do we allow end users to personalize the mix in a way that is simple and easy, whilst ensuring that all of these pieces of the audio mix that ensure that the content makes sense, that people can comprehend what's going on, are still maintained in the mix and aren't just treated as background noise. And how can we also make sure that the creative product that producers have made is still retains its integrity, that we don't lose parts of this story, lose parts of their creative art? How do we balance the needs of making content accessible with making sure that the content is representative of what the producer intended, both in terms of the story and the art, which is not a simple challenge to address. But this is what we've been looking at in the Accessible and Enhanced Audio Trial. I'm now going to give you an overview of the trial itself, how we implemented it, some of the system and how it works. Um, before I lead into some of the results and feedback that we got from the trial. As I mentioned at the beginning, the Casualty Accessible and Enhanced Audio Trial was something that grew out of um, the S3A project, which is the Future Spatial Audio for the Home project, which a number of universities in the UK were a part of, as well as BBC R&D's Next Generation Audio Workstream. The particular um, piece of technology that came out of the S3A project um, is then translated into something that we can trial with end users. And we did this in collaboration with both the University of Salford as well as the casualty team. Um, the casualty post-production team, who I'll also thank at the end of the presentation, have been amazing at uh, be being really welcoming to new technology and trying new things, which has been awesome for testing this technology really out in the field, out in the wild. So the aim of this trial was to try delivering a new approach to personalized and accessible audio based on the idea of narrative importance, which I'll give you an overview of in the next couple of slides. And we wanted to make sure that this trial could re reach a wide variety of audience members so that we could gather, gather feedback, not only from the target audience, which is older and hard of hearing viewers, but also a wide variety of people to see whether this is a solution that appeals to 
the majority of audiences. So the concept of narrative importance comes back to this idea that even the same sound can be quite important in some scenarios in a drama, like the heart monitor when someone um, is having cardiac arrest, and in other scenarios that same sound might not be as important. And the way that we have developed to treat this changing importance of different sounds is by having a hierarchy. So we go from essential, which is the highest, and have four levels, essential, high, medium, and low. And essential is only dialogue. High can contain important sound effects, anything that's a non-speech sound that's got a real crucial role to play in the story. Medium tends to contain the majority of music and sound effects. And then low tends to have a lot of ambiences and things that aid immersion if you have um, either the reproduction system or the um, auditory capacity to take in a lot of different audio objects but can be lost without being detrimental to conveying the story. This diagram is an overview of the system and the ideas behind it. So the narrative importance idea that I just mentioned is encased in this narrative importance algorithm. But the way that we start is with object-based media assets. And so that's speech, music, sound effects, and things like that. We then take those and add a piece of additional metadata, narrative importance metadata. And that tells us how important that particular audio object or that particular bed or channel, depending on how we're implementing it, how important that is. Those combined um, are then combined with, when you're playing it back as the end user, you've got a single dial or a single slider, which allows you to adjust the uh, complexity, essentially, of the audio mix based on your preferences and your needs. And depending on which uh, category or uh, narrative importance level each audio object is in depends on how much attenuation or gain is applied to it um, as you move the slider. So you can see on this little diagram that for something that's essential, we get a 3 dB boost at the um, highest end of the, uh, sorry, the lowest end of the complexity scale. So um, we go from at the high end of complexity, we've got the original mix. And then we, as we move down the scale, we get a boost in the essential sound and attenuation of the medium and low sound. So working with casualty, how did we go about actually capturing this producer intent, this metadata that describes how important each of these sounds in a 40-minute program are? Well, we do this by getting the actual production staff to make these ratings. So this is how we maintain the creative integrity of it. We're ensuring that the people creating the content are the ones that are ranking how important these sounds are. And this comes back to the idea that broadcasters and producers should have control over the range of personalization that's possible um, for end users to ensure the integrity of the content. However, we did have to develop a hybrid workflow because Casualty's current workflow is not object-based. They only produce a stereo mix. So we had to find a way that we could integrate these ideas and get the information that we needed so that we could trial it without having to uproot their entire workflow. So the way in which we did this was rather than having true objects with associated metadata, we had a stereo pair of channels for each narrative importance level. And then within the digital audio workstation, each of these audio tracks could be routed to its corresponding essential, high, medium, or low importance stereo pair. We worked with the dubbing mixer to assign these objects to each narrative importance pair. And this mix was produced after the TV mix. So all the review had been done on the broadcast uh, uh, transmission mix, and then we worked on the narrative importance mix. Due to uh, some challenges around integrating with their workflow, we had to manually audition at the different levels of gain, which was not how we would optimally work. We've been working on how we can have a plug-in within the digital audio workstation to allow people to audition how the control might work from within 
the production process. The key conclusion that we found working like this with the casualty team was that actually adding this on at the end was basically the most complicated way we could have gone about doing this. Having the process integrated throughout the production, so starting with the track layer and having things track laid, even if we're working in this channel-based hybrid workflow, having it integrated from the track lay that we have these different levels of importance, because a lot of them are quite intuitive, would make the process downstream so much quicker. As to the interface that people could try themselves, it was the standard media player that the BBC used, and what we had integrated into it was a slider down the bottom. We can see that currently it's set to the accessible mix, so that's the highest levels of attenuation and gain on the different objects. And at the other end was the TV mix, which was just as uh, the transmission or iPlayer mix. And what this slider is designed to do is allow the viewer to turn up important sounds and balance that with reducing the volume of some of the less important sounds so that they can find the dialogue and the other key aspects of the content more accessible um, whilst not losing anything from the experience of the program. The implementation of, the implementation of this was with an eight channel, as I mentioned, a stereo pair per uh, narrative importance level, AAC file, and it was played back using Web Audio API. And we hosted the trial on the BBC prototype platform, Taster. The demographics of the participants, we um, very much endeavoured to get a wide variety of participants and we can see from here that we got um, almost half of the participants either identified as being deaf or hard of hearing. Additionally, we asked participants um, who opted into the survey how old they were. And we can see from this that the vast majority of them identified as being over 55. So we don't obviously have a balanced sample, but we do have a representation from a number of different um, target groups that we are hoping this technology might be able to help. So what was the feedback that we got from the trial? To begin with, as part of the trial, beyond the work that we did with Casualty, we actually surveyed a huge amount of um, producers of different types of content about how they felt that this kind of uh, approach would fit into their work workflow, whether narrative importance and audio personalization was something that they feel would be beneficial for how they work. And this was a really good quote that encapsulates how personalization could not only be beneficial for the viewer, because, as Rupert mentioned, the same mix doesn't work for everyone, but how it actually could be quite liberating for the content creator, who isn't limited by having to make a compromised mix that makes everyone happy, but could actually make the mix more like the one they love without having to worry quite so much about hearing difficulty or noisy environment. So it's something that not only could be beneficial for the end users, but could be very beneficial for creative staff and production staff as well. For the actual trial, we had 6,228 unique accesses, and that participation was driven um, quite strongly by some high-profile media coverage, the most notable of which was the front page of the Times that we got um, in July last year. It was rated 3.6, out of five stars, which is at the higher end of the average ratings for uh, content that's hosted on BBC Taster. So this is a reasonably positive result for us. What gives us a better indication of how much people found value in the technology is actually the survey that um, a percentage of those unique users uh, filled out for us. So of those who decided to fill out the additional survey, 83.6% said that the control made a difference to their listening experience. So that's the vast majority. Of those who responded, 73.4% said it made the content either more enjoyable 
or easier to understand, which is great because that is the aim that we are trying to get out of technology, out of all of this sort of personalization. We want to make it both enjoyable as well as easier to understand. So again, that's a strongly positive result. We also had some feedback from the uh, one of the actors from Casualty herself whose comments said, this control allows me to balance the sounds crucial to the plot while keeping me immersed in the drama. And that's the exact balance that we're trying to strike with this, with this technology is maintaining that integrity of the content whilst making it more accessible to listeners. Specifically for those who identified as deaf, the vast majority of them identified that the control made lots of difference, which is a good result. Furthermore, 90% of those who identified as deaf said that that lots of difference that they identified was positive. It was either easier to understand or more enjoyable. And we can see for those that are hard of hearing or identified as not being hard of hearing, we've still got a strong majority that are finding that this is making a difference to their viewing experience. Finally, as I mentioned before, part of the, the key to this study was looking at how not only our target audiences, so people with some hearing loss or older listeners responded, but how a wide variety of viewers responded. And we found that under 35 year olds were significantly more likely to give the trial five stars, more so than any other age group. This tells us possibly one of two things, either that the idea of control over media, agency over media is something that younger people want and expect in, in any sort of form, and also that this particular approach to it is something that they find value in. Follow-up user experience studies has, that we've done with normal hearing listeners, um, particularly younger normal hearing listeners, has given us a lot of indication that there are a lot of scenarios where they feel that this sort of technology could be useful, whether it's uh, whilst they're multitasking, so either on their phone or in the kitchen, as Rupin mentioned, or whether it's because they've got people around and they're making lots of noise or there's background noise. All of these sorts of scenarios are something that even uh, that younger viewers feel that they can get benefit from it. And I think the most conclusive thing was that 92% wanted to see the BBC doing more, more stuff like this. So that's a, a vast majority saying that this sort of personalization is what people want. I want to leave ending on a, from a quote from the focus group that we ran in the early stages of this, of this technology, which is, this technology puts us back in control. We are in charge of what we hear, and that's quite empowering. And I think that really well encapsulates why we are doing, why we are all doing what we're doing, is this sense of empowerment that we can give people through delivering audio personalization and broadcast personalization. Lastly, I just want to make a few comments to the ongoing development that we're doing. I alluded to the fact that we're doing some user experience studies. So we uh, completed those in February, and the results of those user experience studies will be in a forthcoming e-brief. So that was the um, AES, uh, e uh, AES conference that was due to be in Vienna, but I'm guessing is postponed. But the e-brief should still be released. Um, further UX trials are on hold for obvious reasons. And we'll be finding ways of hopefully trying to do those remotely. And we also have a project progress. We also have a second trial in progress with casualty. So we, um, I spent some time at the beginning of March in Cardiff working with casualty. Um, and this is taking what we learned in the previous trial about integrating the narrative importance throughout the production process rather than adding it on at the end. Um, where I spent the week working with the track layer and we're evaluating how well that works both for the production team as well as uh, the end user product. So that's something that's still ongoing. And uh, you'll have to look out for when that's broadcast later in the year. So I just want to thank our collaborators. So I just want to thank our collaborators. So that's uh, both Dr. Ben Shirley from the University of Salford um, as well as Robin Moore from internal, internally in the BBC, um, and particularly Stafford, Laura, Reese, and all of the BBC Studios casualty post-production team that have been 
so enthusiastic at trying to get this new approach to personalization out into their products and who have seen the benefit of what it can give end users and are really pushing to see this uh, more widely adopted. I'll hand it back to you now, David. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lauren. That's a fascinating uh, piece of work that you and your colleagues at uh, Salford have been, uh, have, been, have been doing. Just in case you missed the opening of the web webinar, we're taking questions at the end of the session. Submit your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try and answer them at the end of the session. Now, our next presentation is from Simon Tuff from BBC Design and Engineering. Thank you, David. So, as David said, my name is Simon Tuff. Uh, I'm part of the BBC's Design and Engineering Division. Uh, but on this particular occasion, I'm going to be talking to you with a slightly different hat on, uh, and that is as one of the co-chairs of the audio subgroup of FAME. So, um, I suspect that many of you aren't familiar with FAME, so it's probably worth me just spending a couple of moments to explain what FAME is. Um, FAME stands for the Forum for Advanced Media in Europe. And it uh, has its origins all the way back in about 2006 when we were trying to launch high-definition television in Europe. And most of the regions and nations within Europe had set up their own uh, local forums or fora to be able to coordinate their regional launches of HDTV services. Um, the European Union became a bit concerned about this because they were worried that the system as a whole would not interoperate across Europe. And that will present some challenges not only for the technology, but the supply of uh, uniform consumer goods and present the barrier of movement of content, ideas and technology across borders. Um, there was some talk of regulation, but the industry suggested that if it set up its own group to coordinate on a pan-European basis, uh, it could probably fix this problem. And that's how the European HD Forum was formed. At the end of a successful launch of HD television, um, the forum then scratched its head, um, had a coordinated and uh, well-represented group from across both technology, manufacturing and content providers in Europe uh, and decided to reform itself into something that would operate uh, more successfully in the longer term. Uh, initially, it did some work on 3D TV, um, but uh, that never really became a thing. Um, but now with the launch of UHD TV, it's found itself another role to uh, reprise pretty much what it did for the HDTV launch. So that's fame. Um, audio, like a lot of these things, has a particular set of problems that are different from video, and uh, there are a few people working on them, and they often get put to one side. So to make sure that the audio part uh, of these services doesn't get forgotten about, uh, fame formed an audio subgroup, and I have the great privilege of co-chairing that with uh, my colleague Martin Black of Sky. The membership of BAME is broadcasters, not just public sector broadcasters, mostly public sector broadcasters coordinated by the EBU, but uh, all of the main European groups of Sky and some other commercial interests on the broadcasting side, um, occasionally input from BT, etc., and also most of the technology providers and um, a lot of the manufacturers, particularly the CE equipment, so displays, receivers, etc. What I'm going to uh, talk about is a kind of story, really, the arc and development of NGA as part of uh, H UHD TV um, and how uh, that fits alongside the objectives and desires and benefits that public sector broadcasters uh, can get from NGA. Look at how the technology is developing, what we've learned from the various experiments and broadcasts so far, and how those are uh, generating skills and then what Fame thinks it can do to help the take-up of next-generation audio. So the story, and we've heard quite a bit about the story for next-generation audio, particularly from Rupert earlier, is one that in many ways starts back in the film industry as it did for HDTV. 
Um, HDTV picked up a lot of the surround sound work that had been developed for film and uh, produced a broadcast version of it. And similarly, a lot of the early implementations and adoptions have followed in the same sort of arc. So they've been basically channel-based or enhanced channel-based technologies, and they've basically been delivering an immersive um, experience to uh, listeners and viewers at home. This is part of the genius of Dolby's Atmos system. So it's worth mentioning that Atmos is not really a technology, a specification or a standard. What Atmos is, is an experience. It's a brand. Uh, and it's very much focused around the immersive uh, characteristics of what next generation audio can deliver. Now, the standard that we as broadcasters are interested in that lurks in the middle of Dolby's um, array of technologies is AC4. And this is standardized the Etsy as TS-103190, uh, and it comes in two different parts. So it's quite a complicated landscape, but it's not the only kid on the black, as we've also heard. There are a couple of others. Uh, and this is why the DVB had developed a toolbox with three different distribution technologies in it, one from Adobe, uh, one based on Fraunhofer and the MPEG-H technology that Rupert focused on earlier, and uh, a third from uh, Digital Theatre Systems, DTS, or Xperia, as the overarching brand is now called. Um, but these technologies, most of their deployment so far have been immersive. They've been high-end immersive experience, building on what we've done in HDTV. And yet, as we found out, there's so much more that NGA can do. Um, there are lots of new possibilities, using particularly the object-based stuff uh, for broadcasters. And that's what Flame has tried to uh, build on and allow us to go forward. And, and we can see some of these new experiments, not just um, in technology, but in format with the launch of Sony's 360 uh, reality audio service based on MPEG. So from a public sector broadcasting point of view, the immersive experience is interesting but it's never going to serve super huge large audiences because of the complexity of putting a lot of speakers into your home and because where it's at its best is in the formats that public sector broadcasters perhaps do less of these days, particularly sport. Uh, it's certainly found a home in drama, but a lot of that is propelled from uh, the film industry uh, and large title films play less of a role on public sector broadcasting telly than perhaps they used to do, uh, and live music which I guess is still uh, a very significant part of the schedules of most public sector broadcasters. Um, but what we think is probably the strongest component is the ability of um, NGA to personalise, to be not only tailored to the individual preferences, but to the listening environment and the equipment that the uh, people at home have. And uh, to be able to do this, we have to come up with an approach that allows the technology to scale and become cost-effective, ubiquitous, and cheap for all of our users as public sector broadcasters. We also, I guess, so far have uh, a little bit of a balance issue. A lot of the activity has been about the technology, the standards, the specifications, the implementations, uh, and less perhaps, particularly in the PSB space, has been about generating content. So we want to generate more choices for our users, more personalization. We think that's very much in line with public sector objectives. Um, and, and Lauren has already talked about the casualty experiment at the BBC, which is an absolutely brilliant example of how these new technical possibilities allow us to create content and deliver those benefits to users. So how's this all developing? Well, what we want to try and do is get some scale behind this. If this is going to be a regular part of our daily media consumption, we need to be able to make more content. We need to have better tools to generate the content. Uh, we need to have more devices enable that sort of thing. Um, most broadcasters use open standards, uh, non-proprietary technologies within their organization to generate the content. You know, Probably one of the most famous ones of those is AS3 for digital audio. And we've got lots and lots of others. So a lot of work has gone into standardizing an open standard at the ITU for object-based audio called ADM, the Audio Definition Model. Uh, two different versions of that standardized at the ITU. Um, that's uh, a standard file-based ADM in uh, 2076. And in BS2125, we have a stream-based version. Uh, 
Uh, we also need to be able to interchange content between broadcasters and between providers and content creators and delivery. Uh, the SMPTE uh, have been working on a next generation delivery format called IMF. Um, that's ST2067 in uh, SMPT standard speak. Um, and work has just begun on how we can get next generation audio content delivered in that format. We also want all this content to work across a range of devices. Rupert touched on this. Um, it works just as well on a mobile phone as it would on a laptop, as it would on a large scale display. And a lot of people, as they begin to um, adopt NGA technologies, um, will want some guidance. What's the best practice? And we need to test all this. We need to test this with broadcast users, with professional users, and we need to test it end to end to make sure that these experiences get to our users in the way that we intended. So there's lots of work to do. We've started learning about some of this. And the EBU over the recent uh, weeks has been hosting a series of end to end tests with some of the technology providers to see how we can just simply go from a file based format in the open standard to a stream based format and then convert that into the uh, specification as described by DVB for delivery to the home. Um, it's quite an interesting set of uh, tests and we're learning quite a lot from that. So what's the FAME approach to all of this? Well, I think one of the things that we've learned over the last 10, 14 years or so with the work that's been going on across Europe is collaboration. Collaboration is absolutely key, and it's getting the right people together uh, and having the right conversations around shared set of purposes and benefits. Um, testing, as I've already mentioned, is also really important. These are quite complicated technologies, and we're going to get them to operate reliably at scale where people can uh, be comfortable with them. Uh, and then we've got to do quite a bit of testing. Uh, the EBU has been particularly strong in this area by hosting testing, but others have been involved. And we've also had some access to some great events to act as the source. So we've done some major next generation audio testing uh, in a collaborative way at the European Athletics Champions, for example, about a year ago. Uh, we're also beginning to generate examples. I mean, Karen, um, Lauren's already spoken at length about casualty as an example, but we've got uh, test files now for ADM so people can have a reference file. And um, we're beginning to build other content examples along as we go. It's also creating some really interesting opportunities. Uh, Lauren touched on the creative opportunities that it presents for program makers, schedulers, and commissioners. But uh, there are some gaps in the overall technology landscape, particularly in some of the production tools that we're going to need. Um, and so there are some real commercial opportunities for companies and technology providers uh, to produce new products for the next generation of uh, audio and uh, program making. So what are Fame going to do to try and achieve this? What, uh, how does the detail, what's the detail look like? So I think the first thing is we're going to try and identify the most compelling use cases for personalization that meet the benefits and the aims and objectives of public service broadcasters and of the, uh, their audiences, um, and do that in the most cost-effective manner. Now, with focusing on personalization, we think that that's a really compelling one, and in particular, uh, access services, um, as uh, described by Lauren, to help with uh, narrative and dialogue clarity. Um, to support that, uh, we're going to sponsor some uh, user research uh, with our friends at the EBU, uh, looking at photo groups to make sure that we're going in the right direction and we're surfing these sort of technologies in the right sort of way. Usability testing is also really important at this phase. At the moment, Rupert's shown us uh, an example of what a user interface may look like, but every single display, every single set, in fact, there are variations between the different technology providers, all surface these sort of controls in a different way. Uh, and one of our concerns is that if we do this, we'll make uh, put too much friction into the process and people just won't use the technology because every time they switch it on, it looks different. It looks different depending on the underlying technology. It looks different from the display or just the configuration that the broadcaster has put together for its particular service or program. It also probably helps us to be able to develop a much clearer narrative. And this also includes the conversations within the industry so people understand the potential of what NGA can do for personalization, but users know when they're buying devices or watching programs that have this feature enabled. To get there, 
as I said, collaboration is really important. We want people who are enthusiastic, committed, interested, and have something to bring to the party to get involved so that we can build out and create uh, content at scale and deliver some of these benefits. Now, it's a complicated landscape, and we want to try and find the most important paths across it to deliver those objectives, uh, share those with those we're collaborating with, and to facilitate uh, the removal of things that are causing friction, get the right conversations going, uh, and allow us to get to um, exposing these services at scale across Europe. And to be able to do that as well, we have to go and see uh, what we can do. It's not just it's about examples of test content, but it's also um, just seeing what is possible so people understand the creative uh, benefits of doing this and how those manifest themselves with the audience. And being able to share great examples like the casualty one Lauren spoke about earlier so people really understand why personalization can be so powerful uh, in broadcasting. So that concludes a brief description of what fame are about at the moment. And uh, hopefully, so I hope that's given you some sort of idea of the motivations and the objectives of what fame and the audio subgroup are trying to do. And if you feel this is something that resonates with you, if you or, you or your organization feel you can contribute the, to this and help us deliver some of the benefits of personalization using NGA to uh, audiences across Europe, uh, please get in touch with me at my BBC um, email address and hopefully we'll be able to loop you into the audio subgroup of fame uh, and deliver some of these really impressive, exciting and important accessibility and personalization benefits based on NGA technology. So thanks for that and back to you, David. And now our final presentation from John Payton, who is Innovation and Technology Officer at the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Good afternoon. I'm John Payton from RNIB. I'll be talking about some of the accessibility benefits of next generation audio. Now, there's no pictures in my slides, so there's nothing to describe. Um, it's all text that I'll be covering in my speech. So don't worry, you can't see the screen. So the accessibility opportunities that Next Generation Audio offers us are clearer dialogue, um, better access service integration, um, and better spatialization. So we'll be talking about um, what I mean by that and why it's important uh, for blind plus to people later on. So just a little NGA refresher. So Next Generation Audio offers us three main things. One is metadata. So what is metadata? It's data about data, or information about information, or hashtags. If you're tweeting about today's presentations, you might use hashtag DTG, hashtag accessibility, or maybe hashtag fascinating. And anyone who wants to find tweets about accessibility, or maybe ones coming from the DTG or that people found fascinating, can use that hashtag in the search box, and they'll come up with your tweet along with any others that are linked in the same way. Other metadata about your tweet could be the length of the tweet, the time you tweeted, or where you tweeted from. You've also got 3D audio. So next generation audio, as mentioned before, can give you a far richer surround sound. And it's speaker layout agnostic. So again, what does that mean? So as Rupert mentioned earlier, you can have binaural audio through headphones, and it will really sound as if you're in the midst of the action. Or if you have 5-1 speaker setup, you'll get a 5-1 experience. If you have 7-1 speaker setup, you get a 7-1 experience. If you just got a very cheap flat screen TV speaker, you'll probably get jealous. So it doesn't matter how you're listening to the content, it will sound as well as it can on the equipment you've got. And it can offer clearer dialogue. So because you've got that metadata in there that's tagging up different parts of the audio bundle, you can tag up the dialogue, and you can tag up the sound effects and the background music, and anything else. You can tag in dinosaurs, anything to do with track noises, if you've got small kids. And for someone who can't hear the, the dialogue very well, they can use what's called a clear speech profile. 
which increases the level of the dialogue and decreases the level of everything else. So that's a very useful way to get over what was once dubbed the Jamaica Inn problem, which was where people couldn't hear what was being said because of all of the background sounds that were put in there to try and make it more immersive. Another thing this gives us is better access service integration. Because audio description is just another labeled part of the, the main audio mix, um, it can be turned on and off um, as you like. So at the moment, if you're using broadcasting mix and you're sending 5.1 surround sound for the main audio, to add audio description, you need to send 5.1 again with audio description mixed in. So that's 12 channels uh, when it, before it was just six. With audio description being able to be turned on and off, you can just send that out to everyone and a user can decide whether they want to listen to that part of the audio mix or not. You've also got the potential for things like spoken subtitles. So when we did the audio description awareness campaign alongside the broadcasters, one of the things that blind and partial sighted people told us was giving them problems is if you have foreign language content, in the UK, we're much more of a subtitling nation. So if you can't see those subtitles on the screen and you don't understand the original language of the content, then it's suddenly inaccessible. With next generation audio, you could easily send spoken subtitles as a selectable part of the audio mix. And so users who need that can turn it on, and users that don't need it can just read the subtitles. And those can either be read out by a human or they could be computer generated. You can also send dubbing as part of the mix. So like I said, in the UK, we're more of a subtitling nation than a dubbing nation. But with next generation audio, you can have both. So if you're watching Amelie, which is a, a film that's generally watched in French with English subtitles, you could still enjoy that if you prefer to hear the French. Or because you can easily switch out the dialogue, you could have that in English dialogue. And all of the sound effects and music you'd hear would be exactly the same. You've also got the possibility of personalized accessibility profiles. So in 2015, R&IB did an audio description app trial, which is where we trialed an app that would synchronize with the main audio of a film coming out of TV speakers, um, or in this case, cinema speakers. Um, and it would overlay the audio description um, through somebody's phone to headphones that they're wearing. Now, one of the things that people told us about this was they loved the idea because at home, they're living in mixed households. And while they like the audio description, people they live with don't. But they put up with the audio description because um, somebody needs it. Now, with uh, next generation audio, you could have not just two profiles there, but three. So if somebody wanted the audio description, they could get that. And if somebody else wanted the clear speech, they could get that. And if somebody wanted both, then they could get that. So in software, you could be splitting up that bundle of tracks that's coming over as the audio stream. And different people in the room could be receiving different versions of the audio mix depending on their their needs. You can also get better spatialization. So one of the projects that's been going on for a little while is the Enhancing Audio Description Project in the University of York, which is being led by Mariana Lopez. And what they're doing here is they're looking at the sound effect design and the sound design from the start of production to transmit some of the information that would otherwise have to be left to audio description. So they're using sound effects and 3D sound effects especially to transmit some of that information describing what's going on on the screen. And that means if you, if you have the, the footsteps of somebody running from left to right, then that might be transmitting something that otherwise you'd have to describe in words. And by doing this, you can reduce the amount of audio description required um, and also make that more of an immersive experience uh, for viewers. This gives us other opportunities as well, though. So 
in looking at audio description styles, it gives you opportunities to improve that and try different things. So you could have audio description coming from the direction of the action. So then that's giving you an extra channel of information about what's happening. One of the things we did in the iMac project RB was involved in is we tried using a second anchor. So in a documentary called Holy Land, which is about Jerusalem, we had the, the woman on screen that was part of the original content, and she was talking about uh, where she was and some of the history. And then we could build in as if a second anchor was standing next to her, describing some of the things that you could see on the screen. So they could say, to your left, you could see the beautiful stone archways with all this relief work depicting saints or whatever. And that way, again, you imagine to make it more of an integrated experience, it feels more like the content was designed for someone with sight loss rather than having the accessibility bolted on afterwards. And then you can do things with the position of the audio description. So you can have fixed position. So what we called the friend on sofa approach was where the audio description came from beside the listener. And that way it's, it's similar to what we had before audio description, which was a, a friend or relative would describe everything that's happening on the screen. And like Rupert was saying earlier, you can also have it user positioned. So somebody can place your description where they find it works best for them. And of course, again, you can reset the, the level of your description. So if you really need that to be louder than the rest of the content, you can do that. And if you prefer it to be at the same level as the rest of the audio, then you can quieten it down so that it kind of integrates better with everything else you're hearing. So to summarize, Next generation audio gives us better access service integration. We can have that clear speech so that people can hear the speech better, the dialogue better. We can have spoken subtitled language tracks um, just as part of the main um, audio uh, bundle so that people can turn them off and they can switch between languages. We can have different user profiles so that um, different users in the same room could be watching the same content but getting different access services on it. And we've got that better spatialization. So the 3D audio is going to give a better experience for blind and partial sighted people anyway. Um, but you can have different audio description styles. Um, you can have like a second anchor. You can have it better integrated with the original content. And you can use 3D sound effects and that sound design from the start of the creation process to reduce the requirement of audio description later on. So there'll still be some things that need to be described, but you can reduce the amount of talking needed because a lot more of that information is being communicated through the sound effects. Thank you, and I'll pass you back to David. Thank you, John, and thanks to all our presenters in this, uh, this webinar. We now move from the recorded presentations to a live Q&A. As I said before, there will be no subtitles in this part of the webinar, though they will be available in the streamed version available later. Please remember that the presenters are scattered all over the country and they're not gathered in one place, so coordination may be just a little bit tricky, but we will try. <laughs>